We've got three short stories for you today. Movie number one, The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar. In the opening scene, we are introduced to a writer, Roald Dahl, who demonstrates how he requires an ideal setting to write. His thoughts simply don't pour onto paper if things aren't the way he wants them to be. Before starting his work, the writer needs coffee, chocolates, and six sharpened pencils. Also, given how dark and twisted Roald Dahl tends to be, he needs to slam his head off the wall a few times first. After gathering everything he needs, Rold begins to narrate a story about a 41-year-old bachelor, Henry Sugar, who used his inherited fortune to fund his gambling habits. According to Rold, Henry was unmarried because he was too selfish to share any of his money with a wife. The scene then cuts to a flashback, depicting Henry, who is seen arriving at Sir William's, an enthusiastic book collector. As William is busy with his work, Henry wanders around the house and eventually ends up in a library. There, he comes across a peculiar blue book that tells him about Imdad Khan, a man who is able to see and interact without using his eyes. Intrigued, Henry decides to delve deeper into the matter. As he starts reading the blue book, the scene cuts to Dr. Chatterjee, a head surgeon at Lords and Ladies Hospital. One morning, Dr. Chatterjee is having a cup of tea with his colleagues when he is approached by Imdad Khan, who tells him about his unique ability. At first, the doctors don't believe him and presume that he is just there to waste their precious time. But when the man insists, they conduct a quick test by making him guess the number of fingers with his eyes closed. To their surprise, Imdad guesses the answers correctly and effortlessly. Imdad then informs the doctors that he has come to the town for a show. He wants the doctors to conduct a test on him so that he can prove to the audience that his ability is genuine. Dr. Chatterjee, along with his colleague, carry out the test and are baffled by the results. After watching Imdad perform even greater feats in his circus act, Dr. Chatterjee decides to interview him. He actually wants to documented into a book. Imdad happily agrees to it, as he wants to be famous. He starts by talking about an encounter with a yogi who possessed an ability to levitate his body while meditating. He was not your average bear. One day, the curious Imdad hid on a branch of a tree and watched the yogi perform. Upon witnessing this supernatural act, Imdad couldn't stop his impulses, so he went running up to the yogi, hoping to learn the skill. However, the yogi got angry at him for violating his privacy. He threw a brick at Imdad, causing an injury to his leg. Shortly after, he felt bad for his actions, so he taught Imdad his meditation method. According to the yogi, only one in a billion is able to do this. The technique seemed almost impossible to master, but Imdad was confident that he could do it. Starting the next day, he began his deep meditation training by sitting in front of a candle and staring solely at its flame. After years and years of austerity, he made immense progress. At one point, he he came to realize that he could read with his eyes closed. He then used this skill to amaze people around him. Dr. Chatterjee is shocked by all of these revelations and wants to delve further into the matter. But unfortunately, Imdad passes away overnight before he can conduct further study. Upon reading all these details from the blue book, Henry finds himself drawn to the matter as he believes that this skill can be a life changer. From this point onwards, he started his meditation by staring into a candle flame at eye level exactly exactly how Imdad did. After three years and three months of dedicated practice, Henry gains the ability to see through the backs of playing cards and read their face value within five seconds. One day, he goes to a casino in order to put his newfound ability to the test. Much to his elation, he is able to predict every single card and manages to earn 30,000 pounds by the end of the day. This makes him the fastest person in the world to earn such a huge amount in a day. Now, he can be the richest person in the world who can do anything he wants. But as the days pass by, his excitement slowly fades away as there is no more thrill, suspense, or challenge in his life. Every time he makes a bet, he is certain that he will win. Unsatisfied with his new life, Henry throws the money off his balcony. It drops into the streets of London, inciting a riot. Soon, a police officer shows up at Henry's door and berates him for his action. The officer suggests that he find a more effective form of charity, such as donating to the orphanage or public hospital or even OnlyFans. Hearing this, Henry comes up with a brilliant plan. He decides to travel worldwide and accumulate a lot of money from casinos with his ability. With this money, he intends to establish a network of successful hospitals and orphanages. 
20 years later, Henry passes away at the age of 63 due to a pulmonary embolism. By this time, he was able to gather a whopping sum of $644 million and had opened 21 orphanages as well as hospitals. Soon after his death, Rold was called by Henry's accountant, who asked him to write a brief history of Winston Sugar LLC, the legacy left behind by the great Henry Sugar. In the final scene, Rold says that the great man's name wasn't Henry Sugar and that he didn't want to reveal the real one. It's because he wanted to convey the idea that anyone with a big heart and a dash of humanity could become Henry Sugar. I take back what I said, that wasn't dark at all. Movie number two, Strange Way of Life. The second movie begins with a man named Silva. He is seen riding a horse across the desert in order to meet his old friend Jake. The latter is a sheriff of a small town who is currently investigating his brother's wife's murder. His prime suspect is her lame walking boyfriend Joe, who was last seen leaving her home. After several hours of journey, Silva arrives in the town and walks into the police station. The two friends appear very happy to see each other after 25 years apart. Following this, Jake takes him to his place and they begin conversing over dinner. As they talk, Silva recalls the moments they shared together in the past. Their conversation eventually takes a romantic turn and they end up engaging in an intimate activity. Here, we learn that the two of them were in a relationship in the past. The next morning, Silva wakes up to find his partner taking a bath. As he goes to help him with a towel, Jake asks him for the actual reason why he's here. In response, Silva admits that he wanted to see him and be with him. He further suggests that they go for a date, but the sheriff declines, asserting that he has an important case to solve. When Silva inquires about its details, Jake reveals about the death of his brother's wife. He thinks that the murderer is Joe, who happens to be none other than Silva's son. Jake further suspects that his partner has arrived in town after 25 years solely to help his son escape. He also tells him that Joe had a violent relation with his brother's wife, due to which he warned him against entering the town. However, Joe did not obey him and continued to meet with her. Upon hearing this, Silva promises that he will send his son far away from the town. However, the sheriff does not believe him and remains resolute in his decision. An upset Silva then asserts that Jake never had a heart and that he slept with him for mere physical gratification. This infuriates the sheriff, so he holds him at gunpoint, demanding that he leave. In the aftermath, Silva rides his horse away from the town while Jake secretly tails him. As the night falls, they camp in the middle of the desert and separately recall an afternoon from their youth. During that time, the two of them were in a wine ranch with three hot girls. They broke one of the containers and started drinking and showering in wine. In the midst of that joyful moment, the two boys started kissing each other, leaving the girls in shock. Back in the present, Silva returns to his ranch where he finds his son sleeping. He quickly wakes him up and informs him of his unsuccessful attempt to persuade the sheriff. He then hands Joe some money and tells him to cross the border to Mexico, forbidding him from returning here ever again. But as the boy prepares to leave, Jake shows up and holds him at gunpoint. Silva tries to talk to his former partner, and Joe uses this distraction as an opportunity to attack the sheriff. As the two get into a scuffle, Silva retrieves his gun and orders both of them to stop fighting. After this, all three of them point their guns at each other, causing a standoff, and they're not even in Mexico yet. Amidst this escalating tension, Silva urges his boy to take the horse and depart. The sheriff, who is not ready to let the suspect flee prepares to shoot. However, Silva shoots at him first, allowing his son to escape. Silva then drags the injured Jake into his ranch and starts tending to his wound. The sheriff says he will have Silva arrested for attempted murder, but the latter counters that his care for Jake's injury will throw that motive out. The next day, as they converse, Silva reflects on a question Jake once asked him about what the two men could possibly do together. He then answers that question now. They could support and take care of one another for the rest of their lives. That was really sweet. I wonder if the next movie will be the same. Movie number three, this is how you die. No, uh, not, not sweet. At the beginning of the third movie, we see a young woman jogging in the streets. During this, she comes across a peculiar death machine that will predict one's death when they insert their finger in its hole. Despite being nervous at first, she eventually musters up enough courage to toss a coin into the machine and then insert her finger. Following this, the machine activates. It pierces her finger and uses a sample of her blood to figure out her fate. The woman receives the result on a piece of paper that 
reads old age. Believing that she will die only in old age, she happily continues jogging with earphones in her ears. But as she crosses the road, she is suddenly hit by a car driven by an old man. She dies on the spot, and it was old age who killed her. <laughs> Next, we are introduced to a tennis player. He recalls how the death machine predicted that he would die due to parachute failure. This leaves him lost in his thoughts, and he is unable to focus on his game. Not long after, a man whose parachute did not open falls on him, leading to his demise. In the following scene, a young guy also comes across the death machine that predicts he'll die from a hot lady. Later on, the guy is sitting by the beach when he's approached by a beautiful girl. She tries to strike a conversation with him, but he ignores her, fearing that the prediction will come true. The the girl then asks him to help her put some cream on her back. However, he adopts extra caution and intends to walk away. Out of nowhere, a burning girl runs to the water to put out the fire, but she accidentally collides with the guy, causing both of them to burn to death. And that's why you never say no to rubbing lotion on a girl's back. Another character is a teenage girl who learns that the cause of her death is time travel. She returns home and shares this with her sister, but the latter doesn't care. As a result, she throws an alarm clock towards her sister. Not knocking her down. The girl then suddenly travels back in time and ends up in the middle of a war, leading to her death. We then cut to the last character, a middle-aged man who reads his prediction that he will die from a bear. From this point onwards, he becomes extra cautious. When he comes to anything associated with bears, he doesn't even consume honey just because its bottle is bear-shaped. You could just get a different brand. One evening, his wife reminds him of the camping trip planned for the next day. The man is clearly hesitant to go, but he agrees when his wife keeps on nagging. The following day, the couple sets out for their camping program in the middle of the forest, with the man adopting extra caution in every step. After several hours of walking, they set up a camp to spend a night. The man is so scared that he stays up for the whole night, grabbing an axe in his hand. But nothing bad happens, and they eventually head home in the morning. In the final scene, the man returns to his office and shares his camping experiences with one of his colleagues. Amidst this, he is suddenly attacked by a bear that emerges from the trap bin and kills him. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.